次告别吧，水上的列车就快到站，开往未来的路上，没有人会再回返。说声再见吧，就算留恋，也不要回头看。在那大海的彼端，一定有空梦的彼岸。做最温柔的梦，盛满时间，行色匆匆，在渺茫的时光，在千百万人之中，听一听心声。一路不断失去，一生将不断见证。看过再多风景，眼眸如初清晨。Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. I'm Hui Shan from Putra Heights Buddhist Society, and I'll be your MC tonight. Welcome to our new Friday online Dhamma sharing series, Walking in the Buddha's Footprint. This series is initiated and organized by Jeho Guardians Metta Buddhist Fellowship, and is also supported by 14 other Buddhist organizations across the country. First, I would like to give a brief introduction about the speaker, Dr. Punya Wong. Dr. Punya Wong is currently an associate professor in internal medicine at Monash University, Malaysia, based in Johor Bahru. He has been sharing the Dhamma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok for the last two decades. Let us now invite Dr. Punya Wong for the first talk of the series entitled. Believe in God or God. Over to you, Dr. Punya. Today, we are sharing from a chapter in a book that I wrote in two zero one six, and this chapter deals with belief in God or gods. What does the Buddha Dharma say about this? Now, our constitution. Is the noble eightfold path. That is how we live our lives, following the noble eightfold path. And what is very interesting in the noble eightfold path is that this constitution, which guides us in our every day living, every hour actions, contains no mention whatsoever. Of any worship, of any god or gods, zero. The exclusion of this idea actually makes the Buddha Dharma remarkably unique. We we must understand that in the context of two thousand six hundred years ago, this would have been radical. That the Buddha introduced a way of life. A manner of living, which is completely silent within its constitution, the Noble Eightfold Path, with regards to the worship or the rites and rituals, with regards to any form of divine being. Now, even today, for many people, religion basically involves participation in offerings, rituals dedicated. To the worship of one or many gods, I am sure that among those of you of my generation, our parents or grandparents, whenever we walk past any temple or any center or any religious image, will say bye bye, and that's about all it involves. Just pay respect, just worship. Now the concept. Of an all-powerful, omniscient god or gods, was clearly rejected in the Buddha Dharma, but the Buddha did not argue against the existence of higher beings that many people would call gods, or in Pali, devas or devis. Now the devas, male, devi, female. 
are beings which are more highly evolved than men. But they are neither omniscient, which means they know everything, nor omnipotent, which means they are all-powerful, almighty. They are not free from delusions and defilements, and they are certainly not eternal. While many of them may live very, very long lifespans, the Buddha had clearly shown, even to them, that they are certainly not eternal and that they are subject to the same universal characteristics of a Nietzsche, Dukkha, Anatta. They did not create the world or worlds, nor will they end it. And they're still within the realms of existence, driven by their good and bad karma, just like we all are. Now, to the Buddha, the creator, all-powerful, almighty God idea have their origins in fear and ignorance. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha said that gripped by fear, people go to sacred mountains, sacred groves, sacred trees and shrines. Now we have to understand that our ancestors, primitive humans were in a dangerous world. Wild animals searching for food, disease, natural phenomena which they could not understand like thunder, lightning, volcanoes. These were all a constant threat to our ancestors. And not understanding, they created the idea of all-powerful God or gods to give them comfort, courage, and consolation. In many cultures, whether Greek culture or Eastern cultures, you have gods that strike lightning, gods that control all kinds of aspects from fire to water. You have gods of the sea, gods of the sky, etc. Now, people often become even more religious at times of crisis because they turn to God or gods, devas and devis, to give them strength to carry on. But with disappointment and continuing suffering, many subsequently lose faith as the power of the gods, if any, is limited. Now the above was written in a cell wall by a Jewish prisoner during the Holocaust. And he wrote that if there is a God, he will have to beg for my forgiveness. Because this man would have seen the horror of the Holocaust. And those people there would have begged and prayed and done everything within means. Now the Buddha taught us to understand. Replacing fear, not with belief, but with knowledge. Now, devas are beings who are more powerful, longer live, and in general, much happier than humans. But the powers of the devas are limited because they are also transitory beings in samsara. Now, we must clearly understand, dear Dhamma family, that when a person takes refuge in a god or gods, he takes refuge in that god's power. When you and I take refuge in the Buddha, we actually take refuge in wisdom, not in power. There's a big difference here. Now, none, including the devas, can escape the ultimate realities of impermanence, dissatisfaction, and non-self that the Buddha taught are universal characteristics of all conditioned beings and states. No matter how one prays, chants, or back, none of us can escape this ultimate reality. And that's why in this little meme here, it says we are gathered here today because your prayers didn't work. No matter how we pray, people will die. People will have sufferings and disease people will fall sick. 
Now, the Buddha had taught us that we should dedicate merits to the devas whenever meritorious deeds are performed. This is based on the Buddha's injunction to the deities to protect those human beings who lead a wholesome life. And different cultures would depict the devas in forms appropriate to their particular culture. For example, here you see a Dewi, Chinese style, and Dewas and Dewis, Thai style, very much based on their culture. And of course here, the four great kings, which we are familiar with, and here the image is in Chinese culture. If you go to Japan, in front of every temple, there will be the Japanese version of these great kings, very fierce. And similarly, in the various different cultures, they are depicted in their own ways. Now, it is in the Ratana Sutta, found in the Sutta Nipata, one of the early collections that states, Whatever beings are gathered here, whether on earth or in the sky, may all these beings be happy. And may they carefully listen to this. The Buddha is speaking to all beings, seen and unseen, human and devas. Pay attention, all you beings. Have loving kindness for humans. Day and night, they bring offerings. And these offerings are very much variable depending again on your culture. And the offering of merits, the dedication of merits is what the Buddha taught us to share, to offer. Therefore, guard them diligently. Guard them, take care of them, protect them within the powers that these devas and devis are capable of. But as I said, no matter what, no matter how, none can escape the ultimate realities. Now, even Sakra, the king of the devas, that the Hokkien's make big offerings to on the ninth day of the Chinese New Year, himself shows respect and makes obeisance not only to the monks and nuns who live their holy life, but also even to lay disciples who are well established and faith and have done meritorious deeds of charity and keeping the precepts and dutifully maintaining their families, honoring those worthy of honor and supporting those worthy of support. This particular sutta is found in the Samyutta Nikaya, in that section of Devas, whereby it is described that even Sakha bows in respect to people, even a lay follower who merely keeps his dana, sila, and bhavana. And of course, we are all familiar with this blessing invoked in every good deed by many and many a venerable and even my medical students at the end of their service or puja or any program. May there be every blessing. May all heavenly beings protect you. Rakantu Sabadeva. Now the Buddha is very concerned with the liberation from suffering of all beings. And these include the gods, the devas. But he was not very concerned with the worship of the gods. As I said, in the Noble Eightfold Path, our constitution, this is not even mentioned. And the Buddha taught Dhamma to the gods, the devas and devis, so that they too can attain the insight into the realities of life. In the Itipitso that we chant, you will recall the words that the Buddha is the teacher to gods and men. Satta Deva Manusanam. Not just to men, but also to the Devas. Hence, 
Buddhism is actually neither theistic, in which you believe that there is an almighty, all powerful, all great creator God, nor is it atheistic, which completely brushed aside all such notions of more highly evolved spiritual beings. The Buddha Dharma is actually non theistic We do not take refuge in the devas or devis, but we acknowledge that they are present. And of course, we are all familiar with how Brahma Sahampati was the one who requested the Buddha newly awakened to teach the Dhamma. And in many, many cultures, especially Thai, whenever any Dhamma talk begins, it is began with an appeal reciting the same words that Braham Samhapati said to the Buddha requesting for the Dhamma. And we acknowledge and thank his great Mahabrahma for his role in keeping the Buddha Dharma for all of us. Now, as mentioned, the Buddha debunked the notion of a creator. And instead, the Buddha taught cause and effect. Now, while the word cause and effect may be very familiar to us, so familiar that we just take it for granted, I hope we realize that cause and effect as a principle only came into the modern scientific mind after the 16th century. This became mainstream, that A plus B can give rise to C. The Buddha was centuries ahead of his time. Now, the Buddha famously taught the futility of practitional prayers. 2,600 years ago, if a man goes around telling people that practitionary prayers or practitional prayers are a waste of your time, you would have been seen as very odd. And the Buddha certainly taught this. And he asked his students instead to work hard instead to achieve their goals and not just make offerings and beg and plea with the divine for some divine fruit to drop in their favor. Now, puja. Puja is to honor, to pay homage, to respect. It is not practitional prayers. Please do not have the wrong misunderstanding. And, you know, we pay respects when we meet a monk, or when a junior monk meets a more senior monk, or when a senior monk meets an even more senior monk, he prostrates in respect. It is the same. We are not praying to the venerable. We are prostrating in respect and gratitude. So similarly, we prostrate to honor, to pay homage, to respect, and to show gratitude to a great teacher. So please, dear Dhamma family, the Buddha is not a telephone line telling the Buddha what to do. If you do this, then what we have done is reduce a fully enlightened being into a deva, and what you are doing is actually downgrading a fully enlightened being. Instead, we should, with the wisdom of the Dhamma, ask ourselves, what would the Buddha do? What with his wisdom, with his knowledge, with his understanding, is the best and most rational approach to the problem that we are facing? What is the answer to this dilemma? Again, I state, additional prayers demanding that the laws of nature be changed for our sake is neither logical nor part of the Buddha's teachings. The puja serves to honor one. We honor, we respect our teacher. It serves as we chant the words, whether it is the vandana or the five precepts 
or the qualities of the Buddha Dharma Sangha, or the Metta Sutta, or the Heart Sutra. This is to revise the lessons of the Dhamma, to express our gratitude and to soak our minds in these Dhammic lessons. And at the same time, to make noble aspirations. Make noble aspirations, chanda. This is a promise to ourselves as we prostrate to do good with selfless, wholesome intentions. And for example, we will have this wholesome intention to do what we can to make our neighbors, our friends, our family to be happy and joyous, to relieve their fear and understanding interdependence and, and compassion, we know that none exists in isolation and we must do what we can to help those that need help. May all existence, seen, unseen, humans and others, weak or strong, small or great, near or far, ultimately we hope that all have peace, wisdom and awakening. Our nation is in very difficult times now. The Klang Valley in particular is undergoing a very difficult time. And my students who are working there tells me of the tremendous challenges and difficulties which they are facing every day. Many people are jobless. Many people have severe difficulties of trying to feed their families. At least in Johor Bahru, I'm so grateful that there are so many people who have put up little tables, little stores, little cabinets out in front and say, if you truly need, please just take this food. Let us support, not just in words, but in action. Metta is, after all, a word to be lived. Now, the Buddha was crystal clear with regards to the ineffectiveness of petitional prayers. If you merely look around right now and you see the realities of death, sickness, ugliness, sadness, poverty and tragedies and reflect upon it, it is obvious that people of all religions, all faiths and all creeds Pray very hard to avert and rectify these unhappy events to no effect, and yet still will suffer. A venerable once taught me that no matter what faith, religion that you profess to have, we all have one common thing, dukkha. Everyone has dukkha. And that is why the Buddha's main aim was to teach us how to be relieved of dukkha, not by some magical, miraculous way, but by common sense, by being, doing deeds that will lead to it and eradicating, eradicating the causes that leads to dukkha. In other words, we eradicate the causes that leads to dukkha and we plan the causes that leads to the opposite, that is sukha. Now, this is, of course, very bad advertisement. Many, many other faiths advertise that ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open to you. But here the Buddha tells us the plain stark truth that if you want something, you work hard for it. In the Itta Sutta, in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha clearly told us, long life is welcome. And yet, people die. Our deaths from COVID stares us in the eyes every day now. Beauty is welcome. And yet, if only we look into the mirror, we see our aging bodies, our wrinkles, our white hair or no hair, floaters in the eyes, all these, the inevitable progress 
of aging and with it the loss of beauty. Happiness is welcome. Who doesn't want happiness? But if you again look around, you see so much dukkha. Similarly, status. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody wants to run away from Malaysia and go to heaven. But the Buddha tells us that these things are not to be obtained by reason of prayers or wishes. If they can be obtained by prayers or wishes, just look around. Nobody will have the opposite of this five. Everybody will be in heaven. Everybody will be living eternally. Everybody will be beautiful, etc. The reality teaches us the lesson of life. So the Buddha says it's not fitting for the disciple of the noble one who desires long life to pray for it or to delight in doing so. Instead, if we wish to desire long life, then we should follow the path of practice. You jolly well work and plan the courses that will lead to long life. And the Buddha goes on to talk about beauty, happiness, status, rebirth. So if Hui Shan wants to have good results, Hui Shan must study hard, not pray for it. If by prayer she can get good results, if by offerings she can get good results, that will be manifestly unfair and smacks of nepotism. In fact, the Buddha said, no, you want good results, Hui Shan, you jolly well study hard. So the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, states very clearly, prayer is not enough. I want to remind myself and all my Dhamma family here, puja again, because I think almost all of us are involved in puja. It is a skillful means to attune the mind with the habits of noble qualities such as discipline. We just recited the Panchasila, the precepts altruism, generosity, and equanimity. It is not prayers of demand or request. Instead, it is the setting of one's own intentions. So if I say, may my family be well, be happy, be at peace, I jolly well create the causes of my family to be well, be happy, and be at peace, etc. The Buddha is not one who grants these wishes. He can't be right to grant wishes. But he is one who exemplifies what a human being can achieve. So we make aspirations in our puja. Remember, these aspirations are for us to put our mind in to say, I will do this. The aspiration to find the time to meditate. So if I say, may I have peace, may I have calmness, please, you jolly well create a cause for it. The aspiration to follow the precepts, which we just did. The aspiration to be of service to others. And here I always thank my IT team here. They have been of service to others for almost from August last year to now on Friday nights. The aspiration towards greater awakening. And I thank the 312 of you listening in now because you are fulfilling that aspiration towards greater awakening. And of course, we also use opportunity to radiate meta to those who are sick. I've got close friends in JB and KL now who are very ill. So in the puja, I wish them well. May they be safe. May they recover. May they be well. And in doing so, not only do we just verbalize words, but we do what we can to show metta, to support. Metta to friends, to relatives. And right now, very badly needed to society and nation. Now, to the Buddhists, it is the power of truth, which is mightier than the mightiest God. And it is this power of truth, which is there to help us. And I hope you realize that this lies within us, intrinsic, strong, 
It can never be removed from you, an inward force for you to lean on. I do not know if you are hearing this for the first time. I certainly hope not. But you will actually be using this, maybe even without realizing it, for many years of your life. Again, I state the power of truth, brothers and sisters, is mightier than the mightiest sword, the mightiest God, Dewa Devi. But to use this power of truth, there are prerequisites. To use this power of truth to overcome our sorrows, there are prerequisites. And these are collated from our suttas. Sada, you must have unwavering confidence in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And this is mentioned in the Ratana Sutta. By this truth, may you be well. Sila, virtuous in thoughts, words, and deeds. Chaga, generosity. These two creates karma. And this wholesome karma cannot be removed, replaced, or depleted from you. Hanya, wisdom, your understanding, your ability to see the problem and deal with it. And of course, stores of merit from the past accrued with wisdom. Do we have examples? Of course we have. You may be familiar with this, how the Arahan Angulimala, who once was a serial killer, but became an Arahan. And he was using this power of truth. He saw a lady who was having difficulty in childbirth. And he said, oh, sister, ever since I became an Arya of pure and righteous conduct, an Arahan, fully enlightened one, with intention have I never harmed any living being. This is the truth. May the power of this truth bring you relief and safe delivery of the child. May you both be well. And the lady had a safe delivery. He was using this. This is created by Weili, by Ju Sing, by Hui Shang. This is not some divine fruit dropping from the sky. But all this is created by us in our daily lives. And in the Ratana Sutta, so familiar to all of us, so often chanted, we request the venerables, oh, please chant this to bless my house. Please chant this when we are in trouble. But it is not the chanting, sister and brothers. It is the words and the understanding. Whatever treasure there be either here or in the world beyond, whatever precious jewel there be in the heavenly world, there is not comparable to the katakata, the perfect one. This precious jewel is the Buddha. By this truth, may there be happiness. Now, do we have the sada? Do we have the virtuous qualities, the generosity, the wisdom, and the merits? If you have, then the power of truth lies within you. So the Ratana Sutta is an example of this power of truth. The virtues of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are extolled. And by the power of truth in this fact, relief was brought to the misery of the people. In my younger days, I studied many religions in my search. And these were among the things either taught to me in school or from my own search. And it says, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord, thy God, be kindled against you. And in other place it says, for you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And in another, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. 
for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And even as a teenager, I wondered, why does an almighty, all-powerful being be angry, jealous, wrath, avenge, repay? And this disturbed me. Because certainly, if any one of us here have the qualities of omniscience, omnipotent love and compassion, then these should be the furthest from his personality. Now, it is from the Buddha Dharma that I learn why some gods are jealous, why they demand praise, and will even seek revenge. For they too are unenlightened. You will hear of Ashuras and Devas fighting. From the Buddha, I learned how the gods became gods. You learn of how Sakra became Sakra because of the tremendous amount of deeds that are wholesome that he did in his lives. And we are all familiar that when the Buddha was asked as to where is your creator, he famously told the questioner to go home and pay respect to your parents, for they are your creators. I cannot think of anything more logical than this. No imagination, no mythology, pure and simple logic. So, Dhamma family, you can believe in a god, or many gods, and the Chinese got gods for almost everything, and you can still be a student of the Buddha's teachings, because the Buddha's teachings that we call the Dhamma is basically science and human psychology. What is more, you may not believe in any god at all and still be a very good Buddhist. And in fact, an atheist can be a very good Buddhist. I again repeat that the Devas and Devis, we respect them because they are higher beings beyond the human form. We respect them as they are more evolved than us. And they did great and good deeds in the past to be what they are. But they are still on the path to further progress. Some may progress, some may regress. The concept of a person, God, hiding behind the clouds of secrecy, communicating through a few men whom he sends as messengers, and demanding that we worship him or he will punish us simply does not make sense. Now, many people had made their God out to be like an autocratic emperor who wants others to respect him or fear him or face his wrath. Now, clearly, Dhamma family, this is clearly not what an enlightened being will be. Jealousy, vengeance, and anger are defilements, and certainly not the traits of an enlightened and perfect being. So instead of a creator God creating man, man created a creator God in his own image, intolerant, jealous, sexist, homophobic, and violent. Man created these creator gods in his own image with all his flaws and personality. The Greek gods were lustful. They fight, they kill, they strike you with bolts of lightning. Isn't that exactly what man would have done? So the equivalent of a creator in the Buddha Dharma is completely different. Because the creator in Buddha Dharma is not a human being, not a celestial being, and not even any kind of being. He has no individuality, no self, and is impersonal. It is nature, responsible for the coming into existence of all things. And the way nature is, is what we call Dhamma. So Buddhism centers on the understanding of Dhamma and how it functions. It is to make us live our lives 
harmoniously in tune with nature. So in this sense, Dhamma is science. Science is Dhamma. So the Buddha Dhamma is for the thinker. He is free to think. But there must not be any intellectual suicide because of faith. Nowhere did the Buddha tell you to commit intellectual suicide. In fact, he challenged all of us to test everything that he taught. And if we see it to be true, then only to accept it. So the Buddha Dharma is a way of life for the individual in tune with nature to lessen suffering, to live harmoniously and have happiness. It is about you and me seeking to improve ourselves in thought, speech, and action. You and me trying to evolve to the highest possible mental state and to perfect ourselves in wisdom and ethics. Ultimately, enlightenment and the end of suffering. You will be a free thinker. But please, don't just be free. Think as well. Be truthful to yourself. Do not do mental contortions to fit reality with what any religion teach. Buddhism has no monopoly on truth. The Dhamma is timeless and for everyone to verify for himself. And the Dalai Lama, His Holiness went as far as to say, if science proves some belief of Buddhism wrong, then Buddhism will have to change. There was a man called Dorna who met the Buddha and asked him if he was a god. No, the Buddha replied. And what are you? He asked. And the Buddha said, I am awake. The conversation goes, Master, are you a deva? No, Brahman, I am not a deva. Are you a Gandhava? Are you a Yaka? These were divine beings. And he said, no. Are you a human being? No, Brahman, I'm not a human being. And the Buddha said, the fermentations, the process, the defilements, the things that I've done by which I will go to a Deva state or become a Gandhava or become a Yaka or become a human, all these have been destroyed by me, ruined, their stems removed. Like a blue lotus rising up and smeared by water, and smeared, and smeared am I by the world. And so, Brahman, I am awake. And that is precisely what the word Buddha means, the awakened one. Bud from Bodhi to awaken. So the Buddha, the awakened one, was no longer limited or restricted to an identity as any type of being, self, even human or God. He has gone beyond. And the Buddha in his analogy compared himself to a lotus that is rooted in water and mud, but grows up and up and up, blossoming in air, not stained by the muddy water or the mud in which it grew. So in the same way, he was born as a human. He grew up in this world of humans, but he has risen above the conditioned world. He has gone beyond any identity, any self, any human, any God, anything. That's why he said, just remember me as awakened. That's why we say the Buddha. The word means the awakened one. As an enlightened being, the Buddha was liberated from clinging to any illusory sense of self and the suffering that this clinging will cause. So fellow brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, my dear Dhamma family, we don't pray to the Buddha as a god or some kind of divine messenger. Please do not downgrade a fully enlightened being. The Buddha images that we see in the temples and in our homes, 
are symbols of the enlightened state and all that qualities that the Buddha have on metta, karuna, and the Buddha's teachings. When we prostrate to the Buddha image, we are not praying, but paying respect to the Buddha's qualities and teachings. All the wholesome qualities that we would want to cultivate. Ultimately, when we prostrate to the Buddha image, we are prostrating to what we can be in the future. We want to have, we want to develop, to cultivate these same qualities as shown, represented, embodied in the Buddha image. Now, the last words of the Buddha have been translated many ways by many authors, but all translations, in all of them, the Buddha advises those attending him to work hard for their own liberation. He does not say, pray to me when I'm gone and I will save you. Certainly not. Instead, he says, Appamadena Sampadeta. All conditioned phenomena are impermanent. Strive on diligently. These were the last words of the master, our teacher. I would like to end here and show you a very short clip which has made a great impression on me. Let me thank again all of you and let me thank the IT people. You have been most helpful. Let me just show you this clip. Ah, 스승님, 그런데 당신은 왜 불상을 모시지 않습니까? 음, 불상에 있는 것을 내가 알려주지. 저기 바로 커튼 뒤에 있단다. 아, now I find this to be one of the most profound Tan lessons I have ever come across. Because here you have a young lady asking the teacher, where is the Buddha image? Now we are all so conditioned to the fact that when we walk into any center, any temple, we will see a Buddha image. We are so conditioned to that. And here in this place, she could not see any. And so she asked the teacher, where is the Buddha image? And the Buddha image, the teacher told her, is right behind the curtain. When she opens the curtain and she draws it apart, she sees a mirror and her own face. And this lesson is so profound. We do not pray to a stone or a bronze or a plaster or a painting. That is merely an icon a representation of all the virtues and of all the good that we would like to have, that we would like to cultivate. Ultimately, that which we are paying respect to, that which we are honoring, is what we wish to work diligently to get, to develop, to cultivate. I will show it one more time in case it was too fast and too short. Ah, 스승님, 그런데 당신은 왜 불상을 모시지 않습니까? 음, 불상에 있는 것을 내가 알려주지. 저기 바로 커튼 뒤에 있단다. 아, okay. With that, I thank all of you. And I would like to stop here and take a few questions. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dr. Punya, for the insightful Dhamma sharing. Next on, we will move to the Q&A session. For those who have any questions for Dr. Punya, please post your questions in the comment section and I'll read out your questions. Okay, uh, so far, um, there's a question. Okay, can we still use the Anguli Mala Sutta during childbirth now? Yeah, Brother Wu. Brother Wu is my good friend from Suramban. Yeah, Brother Wu. If you have the qualities of such purity as Angulimala, if you have the virtues of Angulimala, then yes, of course. But if it is any one of us who may not have the similar virtues, then that parator does not have that power of truth. So it is important, based on what I explained just now, that it is not some magic fruit dropping from the sky that is the thing that works. It is our qualities, our cultivation that is important. So yes, Brother Wu, if you have someone really with that cultivation, then yes, like Angulimala, who became an Arahan in a very short time, then yes. So remember, it is not some divine fruit dropping out from the sky. It is what you and I have done and whether we have that quality within us. Thank you, Brother. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Um, so we, today, there's not much question. Um, so I guess we'll just uh, end the Q&A session here and I'll proceed uh, to the dedication of merit. Oh, we have one more question. Dr. Punya, if we light up incense sticks and pray at the altar, but put it outside the house, is it okay? Well, brother, I, I do not think you need to be too attached to the mechanism that has been brought down to us. Now, of course, incense sticks was the main thing that was used traditionally. And nowadays, um, the burning of the incense sticks may actually be causing pollution especially if you go to a major center and you see literally hundreds of incense sticks. Now, I think that in this time and age, you can go beyond the incense stick. You can use the essence in your house. You can, you know, either use that electronic essence evaporator, or you can use a candle to create essence because that smell in the old days would have been very important in a situation whereby there was no such thing as soap. And you can imagine in a center where there will be, let's say, a lot of people who there might be quite a bit of human smell and hence incense became such an important thing for so many religions and cultures whenever people gather. Now today, of course, as I said, we have alternatives. And personally, I'm against burning pots of incense and polluting the skies. I think that we should be wiser than that. I certainly would think it is okay that for your family, for your culture that you have inherited, okay, just burn one, that's all right. 
and make sure it's incense and not smoke. Uh. A lot of times what I see is just smoke uh, and not incense. Incense has a fragrance. A lot of times it is just smoke and not incense. And in my house, I have a electronic little gadget that creates a mist from incense. So in the Dhammapada is mentioned that your virtues are like the incense. It will go in all direction. So please remember all rituals, offerings have educational purposes. It is not just an act of offering, but an education behind that offering, which is even more important. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pinya. Uh, we have one more question. What do we do with statues passed down from our parents? Well, they are your family heirlooms. So it is not for me to tell you what to do with, with them because they are your family heirlooms. And some you might treasure very, very well. While some people, of course, will donate it to a center or give it to some other people who wants it. But Honestly, they are your enemies. Now, you know, back in the old days when we were having talks face to face, um, most of my weekends were spent traveling from one center to another. And many a times people give me gifts of Buddha images and all kinds of images. And so as a result, over the years, I accumulated quite a lot of images. And now what am I going to do with them? Certainly my children are not going to be too happy to carrying a lot of them because they don't have that emotional meaning. You know, I said, I gave this talk there and they gave me this image. Ah, oh, that brother gave me this image. To me, it's meaningful, but it may not be the same for the next generation. So what I've done over the last few years is that if I meet Hui Shan and Hui Shan is going to China to study, I say, Hui Shan, let me give you a beautiful Buddha image to keep your company as you go. And I've been nicely distributing them. So I would say distribute them and be alive. Why distribute them when we are dead? At least we can give them to people that appreciate it rather than being forced onto people who may not appreciate it. I know a lot of people send it to the Buddhist centers and that's not a bad idea because the Buddhist centers in turn can give it to people who would like to have a Buddha image. We tell people generally you do not need to buy a Buddha image. There'll be more than enough people willing to give you a nice Buddha image. All right. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Um, another question from TVCM. Dr. Punya, could you explain what's the difference between parita and prayer? It seems that both involve outer power to interfere with difficulty. Thank you. Okay. Brother Whaley, may not be from Brother Whaley, he's merely forwarding the question. Here we are walking into dangerous waters. Danger for me, not for you. Now, Parita chanting, some of you may know, is popular in Theravada Buddhism. It's very popular for housewarming, etc., etc., uh, when people are sick, etc. But not many people are aware that Parita chanting is actually an influence of Mahayana Buddhism on Theravada. It was reverse influence. Theravada Buddhism picked up Parita chanting as a result of the influence of Mahayana Buddhism. Now, what is important in Parita chanting is the words of those chants. As I mentioned earlier just now, when I described the Ratana Sutta, the Angulimala Parita, and the power of truth and the qualities behind, a lot of people think that there is magic in the words. Similarly, in the Mahayana tradition, the chanting of the Heart Sutra is very, very popular and very common. My wife chants the Heart Sutra every morning. I keep reminding her, it is not the chant which is important. It is the words of the Heart Sutra which is important. And the words of the Heart Sutra are very, very profound. It literally, in the 268 words, the entire Dhamma is crystallized in them. It is the understanding of that word which is going to transform us, which is going to make us different. And similarly with Baritas, it is the words of the Metta Sutta, the Mangala Sutta, the Ratana Sutta, which are the popular Baritas that have been chanted, which are important. 
But a lot of people think that there is magic, you know, just get this monk here, chant these words and some magic happens. And you know it doesn't happen. It is the words that you understand, that you apply to your life, which is going to make that difference. And so if we think that by just getting someone to come and chant the parita and all your problems are going to be solved and tomorrow, well, our COVID-19 is going to disappear, you're going to be very sadly going to be disappointed because you have not understood it. It's not going to disappear overnight because somebody came and chanted the parita. So I think that this group, of course, is a group that probably has a lot of interest in the Dhamma. And as you study and read, you will realize that the Metta Sutta, the Mangala Sutta, the Ratana Sutta, all have powerful messages. It is that message which transforms. It is not the sound which is going to magically make everything go away. So you think it is an outer power. No, it's not an outer power. It's yourself. As I said just now, even within the power of truth, that power is not external. That power is intrinsic to you. That power is intrinsic to all that you have done. That power is not a divine fruit dropping from the sky. All right. Okay, thank you, Krishan. Thank you, Dr. Panya. Next question. As a Buddhist, how do we help those affected by the COVID crisis without being emotionally attached? Or how should we practice Upeka despite the overwhelming pain? Now, mm -hmm. the practice of Metta Karuna Mudita and Upeka in its perfect form can only be done by someone who is enlightened, who is awakened, someone who has understood the Heart Sutra someone who has understood the interconnectedness of all of us, someone who has understood anatta. Until that day when you understand anatta, when you understand emptiness, when you understand the absence of a concrete self, we are never going to practice pure metta, unconditional metta, or karuna, or mudita, or upeka, because we are always going to have an eye that is wedged in all that action. People will always see what is it in there for me. What do I get out of this? So while we are all at different stages of the path, and we try our best to practice metta, karuna, mudita, peka, we try our best to be as selfless as possible. And remember, if you are doing a thing, and yourself doesn't come in that equation, you're probably right. Because a lot of times when people do things, that self is actually bigger than any other thing. So if you are doing a thing and yourself does not come into the equation, you are doing a selfless thing. Then your metta, your mudita, your karuna, your upeka is closer and closer to someone more advanced on the path. But until then, all our deeds, Maybe a lot of good, still some selfishness. And that's why it's difficult. And my wife used to say the most difficult one to practice is Upeka, exactly as what is asked in this question. Because to be completely equanimous, to be completely understanding of cause and effect really requires an awakening. Other than that, most of us will not be able to do it. So for example, while we do our best, there will always be attachment. And we understand that. We understand, why do I have attachment? That's because I'm not fully awakened. I still have this sense of I. It may be lesser than five years ago, 10 years ago. My attachment to it may be lesser, but that is still there. Remember, it's only the Arahant who does not have that. So how can we practice Upeka without the overwhelming pain, education, transformation, cultivation, understanding, and for example, when I was in Hong Kong one day, I'm just walking around in some hawker center, I saw an old lady selling food at the hawker center and she was holding in her hand a small little leaflet on the Heart Sutra. And she was reading it, chanting it silently to herself. And, said, I, and I said, I was very impressed. I said, wow, you know, I, I hardly see anybody in the hawker center in Malaysia doing that. But this was this lady in the hawker center and she was reading. 
So when we do such acts of devotion every day, it becomes a routine. And when you talk enough, when we immerse or soak yourself enough, then it becomes our character, our personality, and the way we deal with things. The Dhamma becomes a very important anchor around which our life runs or circles. And so with that, we hope that we can practice, whether it's Metta Karuna, Mudita, Upeka, without being so overwhelmingly attached as to what is it in there for me. Now, my wife asked a very, very good question just a few nights ago after her discussion with her Dhamma siblings on their little group. Somebody raised this question, oh, I do good. But in the process of doing good, sometimes I get hurt or I feel unhappy. And examples were used, for example, oh, Dr. Wu is a doctor. Dr. Wu very, very generously, selflessly helping people with COVID. But in the process, he gets infected with COVID-19. And then the person say, ha, how come uh, he's doing wholesome deeds? How can an unwholesome thing happen to him? And that is why I say, well, that's actually a, a pretty wrong misconception. Whoever told you that in doing good, Dr. Wu will not be affected by COVID-19. The only reason he's not affected by COVID-19 is because he's double masking with a face shield. You take the double mask away, you take the face shield away, he's going to be infected tomorrow with the Delta variant. Now that is reality. Good will beget good under certain conditions. Good will not beget good if you are stupid. I mean, if Dr. Wu says, oh, I'm going to see this COVID-19 patient, oh, out of the goodness of my heart, I'm traveling all the way to the house to see this family, all infected with COVID. Yeah, that's very good. That's out of the goodness of his heart. But if he's so stupid as to not to wear a mask and not to wear a shield and say, my God will protect me, then he's certainly going to go down with Delta 9, with the Delta variant. So good will beget good under certain conditions. And good will certainly not beget good if you are stupid. If you're going to do things like that, I say, certainly you must have the wisdom. So similarly, when we are saying, Upeka, yeah, we try our best, but you must have that wisdom. Being a vegetarian is not going to stop you by, be, by being God by a very angry bull. Let me put it this way. You're not going to be God by a very angry bull if you're out of the way of the angry bull. You cannot tell the angry bull, I'm a vegetarian and expect that bull to stop. It's going to call you, like it or not. So please, good will be get good. Bad will be get bad. They are all under conditions. That's why we say cause, conditions, effect. All right, I hope I've explained this a little bit better. This has been a question asked not once, but a few times. All right, Prishan? Thank you, Dr. Punya. Next question from SJBA from Sister Tan. Hi, Dr. Punya. Why does someone need an altar of Buddha statue to pray when you can do that in the mind? Okay. Thank you, Thank you Sister Tan. Why do we need an altar of the Buddha statue or Buddha image to pray when you can do that in the mind? Of course, if you are so well developed in your mind, you don't need it. There's one center in Malaysia. I won't name it, no permission to name it, but it famously did not have a Buddha image. I do not know now, the abbot has passed on whether there's a Buddha image, but it famously did not have a Buddha image. And I thought that was, wow. So why do you need it? Because some people need it. If Whaley does not need a Buddha image, for heaven's sake, don't force one on him. If you come to my house and you look around 360 degrees, you will see lots of Buddha image. All 360 degrees has it. And that's because I've been sharing the Dhamma for 20 years and for 20 years I've been receiving gifts of Buddha image. And they are all in 360 degree around me because you know people give and then you say, oh, thank you, thank you. And then you put it there, you know? So for many people, they do not need it. Sister Tan is absolutely right. You may not need this right hand rituals. Similarly, we do not need any rites and rituals if, if your mind is so well trained. But many people still need rites and rituals. Many people still need to offer joystick, offer fruits, offer water, offer candles, offer flowers. Many people still need that lesson. Hopefully, it's a lesson and not a ritual. Many people still need to prostrate in front of the Buddha image because they are not at the same level of advancement as Sister Tan. So, you know, we are all like cattle. 
you put a whole horde of cattle together, herd of cattle together, all right, and then you let them go in one direction, hopefully. So some cattle will run faster and lead, some will trail right behind, one big group is in the middle, and then, you know, it formally, finally will become a long line. So we are like that. Some of us may be more advanced, you certainly do not need any imagery, but some of us at the back needs that for comfort, needs that for a focus. Now, Harry said that, Sister Tan, the other reason is communal activity. When it is communal activity, you need a focal point. And that is why even immediately after the Buddha's passing away, for 500 years, there were no Buddha images, but they had either an empty chair or a footprint to represent the Buddha. And I thought the footprint was very, very good. That's why this series is called Walking in the Buddha's Footprint. Because the Buddha never asks us to pray to him. He asks us to follow the path that he walked. And that's why the Buddha's footprint for 500 years was a very valid and relevant symbol of the path of the Buddha Dhamma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Penya. Uh, last question from KCBA from Brother, Brother Sir Chan Wai Hong. Does Buddhist puja, salutations, animal dana, sharing of merits, and chanting also some form of rites and rituals? Yeah, Brother Chan. Yeah, of course, all of them are rites and rituals. Now, the Buddha very clearly taught us in the 10 factors, the Sotapan overcome the first three factors. And one of the three factors that the Sotapan has overcome is the attachment to rites and rituals. Now, for many people, rites and rituals become the means for them of expressing their interest or concern with any form of religion. In the Buddha Dharma, Rites and rituals are merely a mechanism. And as I said, we must never forget the education behind rites and rituals. When we do the Namotasa, it is not for the Buddha to hear. When we do the Vandana, it is not for the Buddha to hear. It is for us. When we chant the Panati Pata like we did just now, it is not for anybody to hear, not even your children or your spouse. It is to remind yourself of your commitment to these fundamental training guidelines. Certainly not to impress Sister Suya that hey, I keep my precept on, you know, I keep my precept very well on, you know. No, 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 it's not that. When you chant the precepts, it is not for anyone to know that you are keeping your precepts very well. Who knows whether Sister Surya is keeping her precepts? It's only she who knows. I wouldn't know. She can tell me anything. So then when we chant, it's purely for us to make a commitment to myself. Not for me to show to Hui Shan that I keep the precepts. That chanting is purely for myself that I commit myself to keep these precepts, at least for this day or for this week or whatever. And similarly, when we say the Iti Pizzo, it's not some magic in chanting the Iti Pizzo. It is that I want to remind myself these are the qualities of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And when I chant the Heart Sutra, it is to remind me of the entire Dhamma encapsulated in 268 words. All right. So these are rites and rituals. Do they serve an educational purpose? If they serve an educational purpose, well and good. Fine. Carry on. Do not be attached to it like it's though some magic. Now, the problem is a lot of people think that by following a rite and ritual, you're going to be awakened, you're going to be enlightened, all your problems are going to go away. That means they're treating it like a prayer, like what I mentioned earlier with regards to the parita. And that's when you become attached to a rites and the rituals because you think that that rites and rituals is the means for you to progress. And that is where it is a factor. That is where instead of helping you it is, I must prostrate how many hundred thousand times? I must offer this, 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 this. Then it becomes a factor. You're no longer free. Remember the Buddha told the first Arahants, now you are free from all human and divine bondage. 
remember, the Buddha Dharma frees us. The Buddha Dharma does not engage, engage Sister Eileen into more rites and rituals that if I don't chant this, well, I, cannot, I will die. I cannot. Now, you may laugh, but a lot of people actually have that. And let me tell you this. When I was very small, when I was young, my late mother was very, very religious. Very much into rites and rituals. And 9 p.m. was almost something sacred. We must burn joysticks at 9 p.m. at night. No matter where she is, we must go home by 9 p.m. No matter what activity we are engaged in, we must pause at 9 p.m. and burn the three joysticks. So it became something to which she became very attached to. It gave her comfort. But you have to grow beyond that. You have to go beyond that level. You have to understand. Lighting the joystick at 9 p.m. to me is not 9 p.m. in Sydney. It's not 9 p.m. in India. It's not 9 p.m. in London. It is 9 p.m. here. So that time thing to me is very relative. But people become attached. And I'm sure you can see it even within your own family. You know, I have people who tell me, oh, the fruits, Dr. Wong, you're offering it wrong. They must have don't know how many colors. And heaven forbid if we didn't bring the how many different color fruits and, you know, must offer. Now, to me, that is very much an attachment to rites and rituals. So you're thinking that in offering different color fruits, I'm going to be all right. No, it's not the offering of the different color fruits. It is whether you understand that the fruits that teaches the lesson of cause and effect. You're not going to get a durian by offering a mango. All right? You're not going to get a sweet pineapple by offering a banana. And that is what prayers are. I offer this. I expect some law of nature to be changed in my favor. Huh? Not sour one. Huh? must be sweet one. Huh? And that is where breaking meals and all this walking in the Buddhist footprints, uh, attempts to try and help each other. All right. Thank you, please. Thank you, Dr. Punya. We shall end our Q&A session here. Next, we'll be dedicating the, our merit. We would like to dedicate today's session to Didi Chas, Chas beloved mother, Sister Lee Kui Ying, and Didi Lin's beloved brother, Brother Lim Chui Sun. Once again, thank you, Dr. Penya, for the insightful Dharma sharing tonight. May you be blessed with health, peace, and happiness. And thank you to the 14 other Buddhist societies for sharing this cross broadcast. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Our next episode will be on the 16th of July, Friday, 8.30 p.m., entitled Of Cards and Shadows. Do stay tuned for the upcoming announcement through Facebook. Good night and goodbye, everyone. Stay safe. Go